Paris and I'm okay now I got it <laughs> I'm Alice Ferris I'm the founding partner of Goldbusters Consulting I'm here with Jim Anderson who is also a partner with Goldbusters and we're going to talk today about fundraising for people with no time to fundraise uh, and just to let you know ahead of time, uh, Jim and I are both going to be talking about a few things, but Jim, we have conflicting webinars today. And so Jim's going to hop off about halfway through this to go host the other webinar. But I've kind of moved his stuff up front so that we can talk a little bit about some of the tools that you should and should not be doing and ways that you can try to filter for the things that are most effective for you. And just in as terms of a little bit of background on us, uh, our consulting practice, Goldbusters Consulting, is headquartered in Flagstaff, Arizona, but we have associates located throughout the US and now one person in the Netherlands who's our, our outlier. <laughs> and we primarily work with small and medium-sized teams in fundraising. So if you are a shop of, I don't know, under five people, under three people, under two people, just one person, and you also have to clean the refrigerator, you're kind of our people. So um, I would like to just get a quick note in the chat, uh, if you can, if you could just notate how many people in your organization are in charge of fundraising. And if it's a fraction of a person, that's okay too. But if you could just throw that into chat so we can get a sense as to who, what size organizations we're working with today, that'd be great. Aha. Uh -huh. These are our people, Jim. <laughs> yeah, I see that. Yeah, so in the organizations that we've both worked at as staff as well as consulted with, we are dealing with primarily the size shops that you're you're talking about right now. And we understand that you don't have time to do everything. And probably one of my biggest pet peeves is when I go to conferences or go to webinars and they say something along the lines of, well, you know, we, we need you to implement this, that, and the other thing, and you should get your digital team on that, or you should get your marketing team on that, or you should get your fill in the blank team on that. And I'm like, um, that would be me. So what we want to do is give you some tools today to be able to prioritize what's going to be most effective for your fundraising program. Because I'm sure none of you have ever said, I have enough time. And really, I don't think you would ever talk to someone and says, yeah, I have tons of time. And definitely in this group, I'm assuming that you do not have enough time to do everything that you need to do. So we're going to talk about how to prioritize those tasks, as I mentioned. We're also going to talk about how to create a kind of quick and dirty plan. And we're also going to talk about what to do and what to avoid, because there are definitely those things that if you are a small shop that you should just stay far away from. Um, with that in mind, just a little bit of background on us personally. I've been in fundraising for about 30 years at this point. And I have, except for my first job in fundraising, always worked in small shops. And I've had to do things like be, be the person who literally does clean out the refrigerator and also deal with special events and deal with grants and deal with major gifts and deal with data entry and deal with all of those pieces. And sometimes I get to that overwhelmed place too, where I'm looking at all of the things that I need to do right now for one particular client that does involve me doing some data entry elements, and I just don't know where to fit it in. And so how do you prioritize all of those things? Now, Jim comes from the dark side, if you want to give a little bit of background on yourself, but he's been working with small shops too. Well, and in the before times, and I mean way before times, not just before COVID, but way back before Alice, because we've been working together, this firm, our firm is 20 years old, and I've been with Alice for 16 of it. And prior to that, I was a salesman salesman. I used to work with national research companies that did local market consumer research. So I was the guy who uh, we would measure the largest 75 uh, markets in, in the country. And then I would go and work with television stations, sports franchises, outdoor companies, agencies, radio, everything you can imagine to try to get them to understand more about their fans, their viewers, their listeners as consumers. And in many cases, I'm working with some of the smaller of the stations and and they also had you know, small teams when it came to sales teams, et cetera, um, research teams. 
So, so yeah, we've always, both Alice and I have always been in a situation where um, we have to be contingency strategists because there are so many things that are going to get thrown at us and you don't necessarily know how, um, how you should proceed, but you better have contingency because some things will not work for you. So with that in mind, how can we focus most of our efforts on things that will work for you? And one of the things that I've used as a tool to be able to explain this, not only to people who are trying to prioritize, but also to people who report to boards of directors and are trying to explain to their board what they're doing with their time, is to connect your work to the development cycle. So thinking about how you are gonna develop a relationship with a donor, how can you tie the activities that you do to the various elements of the cycle? So in case you are not familiar with this version of the development cycle, which is a somewhat simplified version of it from anything you might see in a textbook or something, this is a simplified, here's how you do fundraising. And the first time I was introduced to this model was when I was a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin School of Business. And Don Gray, who was the vice president of advancement at the time for the School of Business, was doing a presentation on the development cycle. And he put this on the overhead projector, just to date myself for a moment. And he said, this is how you do fundraising, any questions? And we're all like, oh geez, is this gonna be on the exam? <laughs> and then he proceeded to say, well, 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 let's pause for a moment. Is anybody in the room dating or has ever dated in, in their lives? Because dating is a lot like fundraising. So when you think about this cycle, the various elements that we have in here are just like developing relationships. You start with a pool of potential dates, essentially, but then you have the pool of qualified prospects. These are the ones who are essentially your type. And you have to filter from that pool of prospects to the pool of qualified prospects and more so in a small shop. You but, really but Alice, need to Alice, why should we have to filter? We work for incredible organizations. Everybody out there should support us. And they won't. <laughs> So yes, so you need to focus in on the ones who are likely prospects, who are likely donors, because if you waste your time spinning your wheels trying to chase after that person who is not your type, maybe you have morals, maybe you have other filters, maybe they're just not available. You know, if you're focusing on those that really are not good dates for you, then you're going to be wasting a lot of time. So you need to filter it down to the qualified prospects. But then you can look at that person across the room all day long and they're not gonna go out with you unless you introduce yourself. And so you need to do some kind of initial contact. Now, here's another thing that we tend to fixate on in the nonprofit sector is the someone indicates they're not interested. That person picks up their drink and walks to the other side of the room as quickly as possible. If you continue to follow that person, you are now a stalker. Don't be a stalker. And we do that all the time in the nonprofit sector, right? We're chasing after those people. It's like, you know, I'm really not that into you, but, but please. But let me tell you, but let me tell you more about myself because I just haven't sold the product yet. <laughs> Seriously, how this is a part of human nature though. I mean, think about it. Whenever you, uh, you get comments or feedback on your social media or, or anything like that, you always fixate on the one or two people that are whiny or complainers, you know? You, you don't pay attention to the vast majority of people who love what you're doing. So don't waste your time on those who have already indicated, yeah, this is not my thing. Mm -hmm. So once you figure out who actually might be interested, then you can focus on that group of people. But you have to go through the cultivation process, which is the get to know you phase. And this is not just a one-to-one -one cultivation. This can be a one-to-many. This can be a many-to-many. -many. There can be any number of tools that you can do to cultivate a potential donor. But one of the things that I find, again, back to the dating analogy that nonprofits are really bad at is that, again, take yourself back to that, that cocktail party or that networking event or something. And you have somebody that you've met for the first time and they start talking about themselves. And they talk about themselves and they talk about themselves and they talk about themselves. And then they say, well, you know, enough about me. What do you think about me? How fast do you want to get away from that person? Because all they want to do is talk about themselves. And guess what? We do that all the time in the nonprofit sector. So how can you get 
to learn about them? How can you engage in some kind of feedback and dialogue? And maybe that's through social media, maybe it's through other tools, but how can you make it more of a two-way communication as opposed to just a, hey, I'm gonna tell you about how awesome I am. After you go through some level of cultivation though, you're still not gonna get the date unless you actually ask for it. And this is the portion that you know most people freak out about. But really, you've talked to this person, you've gotten to know them, and yes, you should be a little bit nervous about asking for something. And very often, people say, well, they're going to say no. And sometimes they do. But sometimes it's the, I'm sorry, I'm busy on Saturday, maybe another time. Was that a, no, you're a terrible human being, don't ever talk to me again kind of no? No, it wasn't. It was, you've got the wrong timing. Or maybe it's the, you know, I'm really just not that into monster truck rallies. So maybe it was the wrong ask. So you have to go back and figure out what the right ask is. Or maybe it's the, you know, we've only known each other for a couple of weeks. I think it's too soon to be your date to your sister's wedding. Maybe it's too big of an ask. So not always, in fact, most of the time, those no's are not the slam the door in your face kind of no. They're mostly the, you've got the wrong timing, you've got the wrong thing, or you've got the wrong amount. So you go back into cultivation, you figure out your nuance and you refine your ask. And it may take several cycles through that part of the cycle to figure out what the right ask is. And then you might actually get a yes once you figure out what the right ask is. And that's when you do the happy dance and you say, we got the date. Um, but if you don't show up for the date, you're not gonna get a second date. So the stewardship piece is showing up for the date. So how can you make sure that you actually did what you said you were gonna do and then you tell them that you did what you said you were gonna do? And you repeat this cycle over and over. But one of the other things to keep note of is that people can exit this cycle whenever they want. It can be you exiting from the cycle as the organization, it can be the donor exiting the cycle. Because at some point the donor may figure out or you may figure out that you're just not that into each other. So just be aware that the relationship does not continue in perpetuity. It may end. Yeah, I think so, it's, it's, it's important to, to think about those short-term or transactional donors that you have. They go through this cycle really, really fast. You know, you got to make once. That, What's that? And maybe only once. And maybe only once. But with your longer term, your lifetime donors, your annual donors that, um, that are making those contributions and they've been loyal for years, they go through this cycle frequently. So when you're thinking about what you are doing as a small shop tactician, as a small shop fundraiser, you need to think about how can you tie as much of your activity to all of these different elements as possible. So when you think about it, if you are asking a volunteer or if you're asking your board of directors where you should be spending the most time, where would they say you should be spending the most time in this cycle? If you wanna pop into chat what your answer is, that'd be great. So where should you as a fundraiser be spending the most time? Chasing people who aren't interested in you is not an option. <laughs> okay, I have one response for cultivation. Anybody else? Cultivation and stewardship. Okay, that's good. Talk, yep. Yeah. Okay, you are all <clears throat> giving the, the response that people who know how to fundraise would give. What's your board of directors saying? What's a volunteer off the street saying? What are your parents saying? Because my, my parents don't understand what the heck I do. <laughs> your parents are saying, you're spending most of your time asking. And that's actually not the case. You all gave the answer that's correct. I could never do what you do, just, just asking for money and going out and drinking with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So one of the things to keep in mind is that if you report to someone who is not as seasoned in fundraising, if you report to a volunteer board that doesn't understand quite how this whole process works, you may need to walk them through this process. You may need to educate them of the, the asking portion of this is actually the smallest percentage of all of this. 
So when we're thinking about all the different activities that you could be doing, you are probably grouping them into these things. Research, cultivation, solicitation, and stewardship. And I would say the cultivation piece includes marketing. So those are the things that you are probably doing with hopefully the bulk of your time, which it may not feel like that all the time, but that's what the, the aim is, what the goal is. Now, again, where do we want to spend our time on this? Well, we probably do want to be spending the vast majority of our time in stewardship and cultivation. You see, that's 50% of the time, according to my chart. And again, this is just my chart. Um, but if you can spend more than that, great. And also someone else mentioned that the initial contact piece um, was in there. That's another 15%. So it's actually 65% of your time is really spent in developing those relationships. Well, and, and what I've noticed, so with Alice's background, this, this long history of, of fundraising experience and, and my background with marketing and sales and psychological consumer motivations and things, we would share things across those disciplines and it helps us come up with some creative ideas. And this one in particular, if you're looking at spending the majority of your time in cultivation and stewardship, that's the old formula I used to teach salespeople when it came to how do you grow your business? I always told a salesperson, there's only two ways to grow business. Keep what you got and go get more. So the keep what you got is the stewardship part, you know, making sure that your donors are happy with you and the, and the initial con contact and cultivation um, research, that is going and getting more. Mm -hmm. So when you're trying to break up your time and trying to figure out when you're going to do all of this stuff, you'll also notice I'm somewhat realistic in that there's a big chunk for other. That's the other duties as a sign that I'm sure you have at a small organization. So thinking about getting all of these things fit into your work week, how do you make a plan to get all of this stuff done? So one of the things that I totally nerd out on is how do I put systems in place that don't necessarily get down to the details of, I have to do this specific task every day, but a bucket of tasks. You know, It becomes the, here are the themes of the tasks that I'm doing throughout the week, throughout the month, throughout the year, so that I can fit everything in and I can get everything done. So when I'm talking about creating a plan here, I have them divided up into daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and other occasional. So on a daily basis, I try to fit these three kind of buckets of things in. Donor acknowledgement, so that fits under stewardship. Some kind of thank you note, email or call, also stewardship and marketing and awareness, that's cultivation. So I'm trying to do something along those lines every day. Donor acknowledgement depends on the day. You know, It may take me a minute, it may take me a half hour, it may take me an hour, depending on what's come in that day. Thank you notes, maybe it's just one that day. Or maybe it's the, I don't have time to write something out, so it's just a quick email. Or maybe, heaven forbid, you actually pick up the phone and talk to somebody. So again, that can take a really short amount of time or it can take a longer amount of time, depending on what you have available that day. And marketing and awareness could be just posting something on social media that day or checking your social media and responding to something. So on a daily basis, I try to do something related to stewardship and something related to cultivation. On a weekly basis, I'm trying to do those initial contacts. So how can I introduce myself to somebody or to some population that I haven't talked to yet? Maybe it's attending some kind of networking event. Maybe it's attending some kind of, wow, in-person event maybe and really just introducing yourself to somebody or a group of people. The other thing I'm gonna be looking at is your top donor cultivation. So on a weekly basis, I reach out to one of my top donors and I'm better at this some weeks than others. You know, There are some weeks where it's like, oh geez, I forgot to reach out to somebody. So you're not gonna be perfect, but this at least gives you a theme to build the plan around. And then I try to do something that requires me to ask for something. And it doesn't have to be money, it may be asking someone to volunteer for something. It may be um, just reaching out to something, someone for a, a, either a cash gift or an in-kind gift. It may be just asking someone to cancel a meeting. I don't care what it is. It's the asking for something intentionally that is exercising your ask muscle, as our friend Guy Malabone likes to say. So thinking of something that you can do on a weekly basis that helps you ask for something so that you get into that pattern. On a monthly basis, I'm looking at what kind of research can I do? What kind of additional planning can, can I do? And what kind of reporting am I doing? 
So the research piece is how can I look at my pool of potential donors and do some research on it? How can I look at some of my higher level donors and do some additional research on those donors? And the research really needs to happen once a month because what I've found is that if I try to do it more frequently than once a month, I get totally down a rabbit hole. So case in point, um, we're working with a client right now that's doing a, uh, at this point, $42 million capital campaign. And we're at that phase in the campaign where we're quasi public. So we've kind of gotten the gifts, the large gifts that we're gonna get from the people who are already close to the family. And now we're having to reach out to people who are not as connected to the organization, but still have the capacity of doing a six figure gift. Um, that requires a lot of research. But what's happening is that I'm seeing this team as I'm coaching them start to get a little bit too paralyzed by the research piece of the, you know, there's a lot of John Jones in Houston, Texas. How do I find the right one? It's like, well, maybe you don't. Maybe you actually call the person and just talk to them. So you don't necessarily want to get trapped in the, I need to do all of this research. However, well, you, you still need you to do some research. You end up, if you let yourself reach that point, you will suffer analysis paralysis. You won't be able to do anything because there's so many things you could do. So my main recommendation for research is to block out one to two hours, depending on how many organizations, how many people you need to research, and that includes grant research. So one to two hours, depending on the scope that you wanna cover and set a timer when you do it. And when the timer goes off, stop it. Because if you don't give yourself a limit, you'll start Googling things. And the next thing you know, you'll be on YouTube watching cat videos. So give yourself parameters to make sure you don't go beyond what you're supposed to be doing. The planning piece is basically updating the plan on a monthly basis. What's, what have I put on the back burner that needs to move to the front burner? What do I need to focus on in the next month? And then reporting would be any kind of monthly reporting that you need to do to remain accountable to your constituents or to your boss. Um, so then on a quarterly basis, it's the kind of any other reporting that needs to happen. Maybe it's grant reporting, maybe it's uh, some kind of government reporting that's required. And also on a quarterly basis, I would say, do some professional development. Are there ways that you can improve yourself and invest in yourself on a quarterly basis so that you don't lose track of why you're doing what you're doing? Okay, so then with that as a context of the, you've got your time and you're mapping it to the development cycle and you're starting to think about what are the consistent things I'm gonna do daily, weekly, monthly, and quarterly. What are the things you should actually do in that time? And so the first thing that I've actually rearranged here, Jim, um, what are the things you shouldn't be doing? Um, because there are certain things that are kind of a time suck. And it's not that you let go of them completely, but what should be lower priority for you? And um, we're gonna start with events. This is you, Jim. So um, events are a necessary evil for many people. There are certainly those events um, that some organizations are doing that should go away. There are, there are events that never should have been allowed to breathe air because they just were not a great idea. But it's so hard because frequently you're, the events that you're doing, are you're doing them because you have a board or, um, or a, a legacy that thought that this was a great idea. So how do you tell somebody, a well-meaning board member who might actually be a donor to your organization, that is, if you have policies in place that require board uh, 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 financial support, which I think all organizations should have if possible, um, but how do you tell somebody who's important to the organization, who may be contributing you know, power or wealth or whatever it is, how do you tell them that their idea sucks? Because some of them do. And uh, the, I came up with a, with a process of evaluating things that I refer to as the automated no pain, no machine. This is how you tell somebody no without suffering um, the slings and arrows that would, would, uh, would potentially be hurled at you. And Alice, are you gonna post a link to the actual form? 
I can that, do that. Was that okay? Thank you. <clears throat> because we created a form. It's on our website. You can go download it for free. There's two versions that I put up there. One of them um, is a PDF. So if you just need something quick, hand out to a few people to take them through this evaluation process, just print it off and use it. If, however, you want to take it and replace our logos with yours, you can tell your boss you worked on it all week. <laughs> oh, that would be unethical. But then again, that's another presentation. Okay, so here's the, here's the things that I usually am going to evaluate events on. Now, you can use this to evaluate any type of project that you might be considering undertaking, any ideas. Um, they, can, they can be ran through this system. Granted, the, um, the things you're going to evaluate them on might change. Now, you might look at these five things and say, hey, there's something missing. What's really important to our organization is this. That's okay. Add another column because the way that this is laid out, the five things that you see here, revenue, um, effort, um, uh, success, uniqueness, and mission match, each of these things are the columns that are laid out on this grid and you run, you run the um, uh, rows are all the ideas that you're going to be evaluating. So you end up with rows or ideas, columns are things you evaluate them on and you rank them on one to 10. You come up then with an objective number. The key to making this work, the key to getting people to understand their idea is not in the best interest of the organization is everybody who has input on the decision that's going to be made needs to participate in this evaluation process, preferably um, in person or, or uh, live in Zoom or something like that. <clears throat> So you, um, you rank each of these on, on a one to scale, one to 10 scale. So potential revenue, are you going to make a lot of money? And what is a lot of money? What does success look like to you? For some organizations, you know, if this thing can raise a couple thousand dollars, that's a lot of money. Um, for others, if it's not going to net 100K or more, why would we even bother? Uh, so you give it a 10 if it's going to raise a lot of revenue based on your terms, and you give it a one if, if it's going to uh, not raise much money. Oh, and by the way, if, if you were to do a fundraiser and, and uh, you don't make the amount of money you had planned, you don't hit your goals, you do not get to say, oh, no, it's a friend raiser. No, no. If you meant for this to be a fundraiser and it doesn't raise funds, it is not a friend raiser. It's a failed fundraiser. That doesn't mean that your events can't have um, dual goals, but they need to be clearly identified. Maybe we're not going to make a lot of revenue here, but we really need to do some cultivation and stewardship. Then, then that's a different way to evaluate it. So the next column that we have here is the amount of work. Is this going to take a ton of work to get done? And how many, what kind of resources do you have to put into this? So, you know, do I have to, do I have to spend a lot to make this work? Do I have to in, involve um, all of my, all of my uh, hours for six months prior to the event? Do I have to engage uh, dozens or hundreds of volunteers to make this thing work? Um, it can be a huge, a huge, um, a huge variable for you to uh, evaluate, you know, because there's some events that are put on with one person and no volunteers. There's other events that we've worked on that um, have uh, literally thousands of volunteers make this event happen. So if it's a lot of work, it gets a one. If it's barely any work at all, it gets a 10. <clears throat> Be cautious on some of the, it gets a, um, some of these rankings because sometimes you might work with an organization that says, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna do this fundraiser for you. You don't have to do anything, just send it out to the list and I'm, we're gonna take over and do it for you. Think about a benefit concert or something like that that you might do. Be really careful with that because what you're doing is you are giving your brand ownership to a third party. You need to be careful about that. So um, just because it doesn't seem like a lot of work because somebody else is gonna do it, there might be high risk in here. Um, next on the list is likelihood of success. Will this be successful? Again, this is defined by your own terms. What does success look like? We want to engage with a um, hundred new people that we've uh, never got to an event before. We want to raise X number of dollars. You know, what does it look like? We want, we want public awareness in the community. Uh, we want this to be something people talk about. So you define what success looks like. <clears throat> if it's likely to be successful based on your terms, get a 10. If it's not, you get a one. Uniqueness, uniqueness is 
a, a quick evaluation as to are we putting on a fashion victim that everybody's doing? How many wine and cheese tastings happen in your community during the summer months? You know, how many golf tournaments happen in your community during the summer months? So is your event unique and something that people will find memorable? Uh, if so, it gets a 10. If it's not unique, if it's a fashion victim, just another wine and cheese tasting with a silent auction, it gets a low number, probably a one. <clears throat> Mission match. This is, to me, this is one of the most important variables here. Um, I think for me, uh, likelihood of success and mission match are probably the two most important because the others can, um, can, be, can be the variables that are different depending upon event. But mission match is so important. You know, does the event that you're putting on scream, this is my organization? OK, so is it something that is so perfectly in alignment with who you are that somebody that hears about it is like, oh, of course it's them. Of course they're doing this. So um, that mission match, uh, again, if it is in if the event that you're doing uh, screams that it matches what your focus is, then you would give it a 10. If it is not a mission match, suppose you're a substance abuse program and, and somebody wants to do a wine and cheese tasting. Um, not really in alignment with what, <laughs> with your mission. So um, that would get a one in, in that case or a lower number. But you go through this and you rank all of the, or you tally up the numbers for each of the columns um, that you have decided to, to evaluate on. You'll come up with a total and the, the cream will float to the top and the other stuff will, will sink to the bottom. And often the person who came up with the idea that was a little, a little off the wall or made no sense, they will forget that they suggested it. They will not dig their heels in and argue if they go through this process and you have agreement on what you're evaluating. So one of the things that this tool helps you do is prioritize those things that are more productive and that everyone is going to agree on as these are the things we should be looking at doing. So when you do this exercise, as Jim mentioned, I recommend, we recommend that you have everybody in the room who's going to be a, you know, share a constituent of this thing, do this evaluation and then look at the top three to five and then do a gut check. So don't rely just on the numbers, but at least it'll bring those top ideas to the top. And then you can have some substantive discussion about what's the best event or events for your organization. Uh, I'm going to do one more thing that is a don't do and but I'm going to let Jim jump off because he's going to go over to another webinar right now. <laughs> so, so thanks, Jim, for being part of this and I'll have your contact information at the end as well. Absolutely. Thanks everyone for attending. Um, hopefully we have and will continue to make good use of your time today. Bye bye. So the other thing that we are looking at as kind of the time sucks, which is maybe something that is a surprising time suck is board involvement in fundraising. And the reason that we put this in as something that should be a lower priority item for you is that we still want board involvement. We still want volunteer involvement in fundraising, but we don't necessarily want to delegate the asking portion, the solicitation portion to the board. Um, if the board is the only ones who are doing asking and fundraising, that is totally fine. So that I'm not saying that it, this is universal, but in general, what I would like to do is engage the board, especially in small shops and other things that are going to be more productive. So for instance, making that initial contact, making that introduction piece, doing the, the cultivation piece, those are all really important things for board members to be involved in. The other thing that I really want board members involved in are providing testimonials or gathering testimonials. So how cool would that be if that, for instance, you could send volunteer board members out to talk to a grateful patient or talk to a student and have them collect the story. And that would get them more involved and more engaged in the, yeah, this is totally why I'm volunteering for this organization because sometimes they're far enough removed from the actual service recipients of your organization that they don't necessarily get why what you do is important and why you prioritize the things that you do. But if you can get your board of directors and any other volunteers involved in collecting those stories, that gives them a much more powerful connection with the cause and what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. 
The other thing that I like to have boards do is discrete tasks. So maybe it's the, I need you to send five thank you notes to these five donors. I've already pre-addressed the envelope and pre-stamped it. All I need you to do is write a note inside of this card and stick it in the mail. If you are a volunteer, as well as being a staff person in fundraising, I'm sure you can relate to this of the, if someone doesn't make it easy for you, it doesn't get done. Um, I've been seriously traveling with one stamped note card that has gone practically around the country over the last three months because I just don't get around to doing it because I realized if I just put the name and address on the envelope before I leave, I might actually get this done. So that's, you know, Dr. Heal thyself. Um, but I'm actually looking at how can we make this as easy as possible for our volunteers. And then the reason that I like to keep boards out of the asking portion is that they're gonna put it off. They're gonna find all sorts of reasons for this to not happen. Oh, well, you know, it wasn't the right time. Oh, sorry, I ran out of time that day or gee, it was raining, or gee, it was too sunny, they're going to come up with any number of reasons to not make that ask. And so you end up spending more time bird dogging someone to make that ask than actually doing the ask yourself. So as much as possible, I try to keep board members engaged in the rest of the development cycle and not necessarily in the solicitation piece. Now, if you have a board member that totally loves fundraising and totally loves being part of that ask, absolutely keep them part of that process but I'm guessing it's gonna be a pretty small percentage of your board. And so if you can just focus your efforts again on where can you be the most effective with your resources, then that will help, help you be more efficient with your time. Okay, so what else do we want to do in fundraising when you don't have enough time to do all of this? Well, the main thing for the rest of this presentation is how do we focus on the low hanging fruit? So what are the things that are more likely to be successful than others? And how can you prioritize that in your efforts on a day-to-day -day basis? So thinking about those, one of the things that you should think about is who are your inner circle? Who are those people that if you were in a crisis, who are those people that you reached out to when COVID was first becoming real to say, hey, we need your help. And I'm guessing it's a pretty short list. And regardless of the size of the organization, small or large, the inner circle tends to be relatively small across the board. You have that small group of people that you can count on. And so if you are in a crisis situation, so if you're in a case where you have to generate money really fast, know who your inner circle are. These may be some of your board members. I'm not gonna say all of them because Universally, I haven't seen anyone have a board that is totally the inner circle who are like, absolutely, I will give you money for this. You will have a percentage of your board who are probably in the inner circle. You probably have a couple current donors that are in that inner circle of the, they are so loyal to you that they will do whatever you need to have done. Maybe you have a couple staff people who are like, yes, I will pitch in. Maybe it's not money, but maybe it's the, this person is always ready to support your initiatives. Or maybe it is money. Maybe this person does have some capacity to give to the organization. You probably have a couple volunteers that you count down all the time that you can call out to. And also I would include, include your personal network. You probably personally have people that you can call on who will support whatever organization you happen to be working for at, the at that time if you need that level of support. So think about and come up with a list of here are my, my reliables, essentially, here are my loyals. And in one case for one of the organizations we're working with, they actually have a list that's called the loyals list. Now they've expanded their list to probably about a thousand people that they're communicating with more regularly than other donors. So they send a quarterly letter from the executive director out to this loyals list Looking at the list, which I saw the list for the first time a couple weeks ago, I would argue that there's about 10% of that loyals list that's the inner circle of the, those are the people that they can count on for anything, which is pretty good. hundred people, that's awesome. Your list may be smaller, your list may be larger, but come up with that list of those people that you know you can count on so that when push comes to shove, you know who you can reach out to. The other thing you wanna think about is what tactics are you gonna use? to fundraise with this inner circle, but also what tactics are you gonna to use to fundraise in general? 
And particularly with the inner circle, these are going to be people that you will probably do in-person contact with, or at least some kind of face-to-face -face contact. So that might be by Zoom nowadays. Um, are they people that you can just email? Are they people that you reach out to via social media? Or are they people where you can pick up the phone and they're gonna give to you? When you're thinking about that inner circle, you will probably have an idea as to which particular people will like each one of these tactics. So for instance, I have one donor who is definitely an inner circle donor for a public radio station that we work with. And if I am in a crisis situation and I need something in the range of 10 to $25,000, because that's kind of his sweet spot, I email him because that's how he wants to be contacted. Um, I have another donor that if I need something, I know I need to call him and say, okay, can you help me with this? Um, and then we have a couple donors with this same organization that I reach through Facebook Messenger. And, and so that is the social media element that sometimes you communicate with your inner circle with. And then of course, there are those people that you do actually want to meet with. So thinking about how you're going to talk to that inner circle, these are the different tactics that you might use to fundraise with them. And I would say, take some of your time back to that top donor um, work that you're doing on a weekly basis. On a weekly basis, reach out to this inner circle because you want to make sure that they're always at the ready to potentially support you when you need it. And the thing that's nice about the inner circle is that you can be very direct and transparent with this group you can kind of tell them how the sausage is made. This is the group that you can be very honest with. And they're also the ones that you can really genuinely ask for advice from, not with the pretense of asking them for money because they're the people who really want to be part of the family, so to speak. Um, an example of this is one of the organizations that's running a campaign that we're working with right now. Um, they have a an inner circle donor whose largest gift in the past has been $100,000. And the person just sold their company for something ridiculous like $100 million. So this person has come into a lot of money quickly and is a very generous person, but obviously has not been giving at that level before. And they had a gen genuine conversation with this person saying, look, we're not gonna ask you for money right now, but we wanna help you talk through some of your ideas about what you want to do with this windfall. And it was actually the development director that said to him, are you going to take some of this and, and like have some fun with it? Oh, well, I wasn't really thinking about, and she's like, no, you should, you earned this. You, you have built this company over the last 50 years. You should take some time and, and celebrate and spend some of it on yourself. And I appreciated the fact that she was the one who had to bring that up with him. Um, so that's the kind of conversation and that's the kind of relationship you potentially can have with that inner circle list once you identify it. Okay, so what are some of the other things that you should spend be spending your time on because you don't have any time? And it's the first focus on the stuff that's easy. That, that is the thing. You don't wanna focus on the hard stuff first. Um, there's actually a, an idea in productivity circles called Eat Your Frog, which is uh, comes from supposedly a Mark Twain quote, but a lot of things get attributed to Mark Twain that aren't actually Mark Twain. But apparently Mark Twain once said, if you eat a live frog first thing in the morning, the rest of your day will seem easy. So this concept in productivity circles is that you do the hard thing first. Well, a friend of mine who presents with me uh, on occasion, he and I talk about productivity topics and fundraising. His, his handle is fundraiser Chad, is Chad Barger. And he says, you know, I just can't eat a frog right away. I have to eat some tadpoles first. So we're talking about some tadpole things that these are easy things you can do that you would probably want to fit into your schedule that it may not produce immediate dollars and it may not produce big dollars, but you can get them done because they're easy. Um, so direct mail is one of those things. I would make sure that you plan out throughout your calendar how many times you're going to drop some kind of mailing appeal. And the thing about we have been predicting the death of direct mail for decades now, and it's still around, right? Because this is one of those things that people still respond to. Now, if you expect them to put a check in an envelope and put it in the mail to you, they may not do that. But if you give them an online option to make your donation, but you still send them a letter, 
you're still going to have an effective appeal. The thing about direct mail, however, is that one of the things that we do as a sector is that we make this way too complicated. We think we have to come up with a brand new letter every year end. We think that we need to have all sorts of fancy designs on this. And one of the things that direct mail studies have demonstrated is that the more the package looks like an actual letter, the more likely people are to open it and read it. So all of the work that you're spending on putting together a four color, very fancy design is actually not necessarily needed. I'm not saying, totally throw that out, but I am saying keep the design relatively simple. The other thing is, is that you want to stick to a couple packages. You don't have to reinvent the wheel every single time. You can take the same appeal you did last spring and update it, refresh it a little bit, but not change the design at all and send it out again. Um, that's one of those things that we get tired of seeing it, but your donor isn't reading every single piece of mail that you send them. So the fact that you think it's repetitive doesn't necessarily mean that the donor thinks it's repetitive. So keep it simple and stick to a couple packages. The other thing that I, I passed over is the first bullet point, which is the use an outside vendor for this. If you are mailing more than 200 pieces, don't try to do it in-house. I know we're trying to be wise with our budget and I'm not saying waste money. And if it's up to 200 pieces, I say, go ahead, send it in-house. But if it's over 200 pieces, use an outside vendor to do this because they're going to be able to do it much more effectively and efficiently, and they will probably save you money on postage. So partner with a local vendor to do that. The other point that I wanna make is that email does not replace this. Email can be used in conjunction with a direct mail appeal and email can be used as a separate appeal, but it's a very different tactic. and even though it kind of looks the same, it's different. And people respond to email differently than they respond to direct mail. So it doesn't replace it, but it can augment it. The other thing to think about with direct mail is who is your target audience? So if you had to guess what the most responsive age segment is to direct mail, you would likely guess older. So 65 plus, 70 plus, and you'd be right. That's the most responsive demographic to direct mail. So one thing is don't use 10 point font. That's like one of my pet peeves. It's the, I can't read this and I'm not 70 plus. So make sure you use a font that people can actually read. But the other thing is, what's the second most responsive age demographic to direct mail? It's under 30. <laughs> And why is that? Why do you think that is? It's because we don't get mail anymore. <laughs> so people who are younger donors are totally used to deleting your email, but you send them a letter and like, what's this? And so you open it up because you don't get hardly any mail anymore. So I would say that if you want to attract both the younger audience as well as the older audience, you must, must be doing some kind of direct mail. Okay. So the other thing that funny enough is easy is plan giving. And you're thinking, what? That's not easy. Well, this is plan giving for normal people. I'm not talking about setting up trusts. I'm not talking about setting up charitable annuities, any of that stuff. I'm talking about telling people that you accept plan gifts. That's all I'm talking about. So it's a matter of focusing on gifts and wills and bequests and having sample language ready. And you can put it on your website. In fact, a lot of organizations do that where you have a page. This is here's the language that you can include in your will or trust to include us in your in your legacy giving. But the other thing is to just put a footer on everything. Maybe it's in your email signature. Maybe it's on the bottom of that letter that you actually mailed. Um, it used to be when I suggested this way back in the day, it was the put it on the bottom of your fax cover sheet. So I've been using this strategy for a long time. And it is just making people aware that you accept gifts and wills and bequests. So what I do is come up with the sample language and it is incredibly simple for most states. So I would say, check with the community foundation to find out if this is something that they can help you craft. And if there's people who want those more complicated tools, partner with another organization 
like a community foundation, for instance, to be able to do those things in the tools for you. So you don't have to worry about the complicated tools, but you do have to have simple language available. This is about as simple as it gets. I bequeath to fill in the blank your organization, a percentage of the estate or a specific amount up to the donor to be applied to general endowment or fund area or general operating. You know, you can basically include any of that stuff. That's really all that's required for most states. I would, of course, check with the requirements for Florida, but um, for most states, that's really all you need. Okay, so you've done that, checked it off. The other thing that you want to think about now is that once you get done with the easy stuff is that what's the stuff that you need to work on a little bit more, but it may pay off in the end because you don't want to ignore those things that take more time, but it's definitely the long game. So major gifts are one of those things. And you really need to be working on this on an ongoing basis in order for major gifts to work for your organization. But you obviously don't have time to be a full-time major gifts officer. So thinking about how you're going to prioritize your activities in major giving, here's what I like to think about. Who are your top 10? And if, you're, if your major donor list is small, it may be less than your top 10. It may be your top five. But who are your top 10 donors that you need to make sure that you communicate with on a regular basis? At the same time, who are your top 10 prospects? Who are those next 10 people that you think they have the capacity to make a larger gift? And how can I make sure that I continue to have conversations with them? And again, depending on the size of your donor base, it may be your top five. I wouldn't go under five for either one of these categories because you should be able to communicate regularly with anywhere, you know, 10 people tops. And what you're looking to do is try to do five to seven cultivation advances with each one of those people over the course of your relationship before you ask them for something. So understanding what your plan is for your top 10-ish donors and your top 10-ish prospects is something that you fit in to that weekly plan where it says, reach out to your top 10 donors. So on a weekly basis, you do something with this list. And the nice thing about having it be only about 10 is that since you have a lot of other responsibilities, you can probably remember 10 to 20 people and think to yourself, hey, you know, have I reached out to Heather, for instance, um, today? Or have I reached out to Tareen recently? So those are the types of things that if you have a small list, especially if you have multiple priorities, you can at least remember who they are. The other thing you wanna think about that again, requires more time investment and is probably the long game is corporate donations. And I'm calling them corporate sponsors for a reason because I'm gonna put corporate foundations under the foundation and grants category. But corporate sponsors are people or organizations that essentially sponsor events that maybe sponsor programs on a limited basis. And this is relationship building. And typically, this is about promotion for the corporation. This is one of those that depending on your cause and depending on your community, I might even cut this out completely. But if you are doing some kind of corporate sponsorship, this could be some kind of medium term windfall, as long as you have a relationship with the person who is the decision maker, which is typically a community relations or marketing person. So you need to spend some time building that connection with that person. And so that works into your weekly schedule of who do I need to reach out to, to this week. The other thing that you can think about in terms of those longer term goals is managing your data. And you're thinking, what the heck does this have to do with raising money? Well, this is where your likely prospects are going to come from. So as you think about how you're going to prioritize those people that you're talking to, if you don't have the information on your donors now, you won't be able to prioritize the right people. So thinking about using a database to track information is going to be critically important. And I don't care what size shop you are, I'm just gonna tell you right now, please stop using Excel. The number of organizations I've talked to lately where they say, well, we have six different Excel spreadsheets that have our donors from the last 10 years. And like, please just, you can find free ones online now that are cloud-based. You can find ones that have small shop pricing. And almost every major vendor right now has some kind of small shop pricing that even if you have only a hundred records, it's not gonna cost you all that much. Because as much as you can get information that people can access, the better. 
So how can you get the information not only in, but out? Now, um, Shereen, I see your question. One of the ones, just because I looked at it recently, um, Bloomerang actually does have a free version that is pretty limited in that they lock down a lot of the tools, but they also have a small shot version that I think is under, under $99 a month. Um, the other one that has pretty good small shop functionality is Little Green Light um, that also has pretty affordable pricing. Another one that markets to small shops is Donor Snap. I actually don't really recommend that one. I mean, it's functional and it's fine and it is really inexpensive. But the challenge that I found is that it, you really bump up against the limitations of that database quickly. And as your organization grows, it has difficulty growing with you. Um, so those are the ones that immediately come to mind. I will say that right now, most small shops do not need, do not need Razor's Edge. I've actually had organizations that spent a ton of money on Razor's Edge and it was just completely, you know, using a sledgehammer to kill a fly. So um, that one, I would say, just kind of take out of the evaluation unless you really think you're gonna grow huge quickly. Hopefully that helps. Okay, so the things that you should be looking for overall in your database is that you do want it cloud-based. And that is the nice thing about both Little Green Light and Bloomerang, as I mentioned, they're both cloud-based. And ask, ask them the question of how do you deal with a small number of records? Because sometimes with these products, they will tell you right away that if you have less than a thousand records, we really don't recommend this. Um, you're also looking for stuff that's scalable, as I mentioned, and you're also looking for something that's going to allow you to have multiple users. One user obviously is minimum, but I would prefer to say, does that pricing include two users at least so that you're not, you don't have to be the only person who knows how to do this. The other thing that you're looking for is, do they have some kind of email newsletter functionality? This is kind of a nice to have thing, because if they don't, you can do it through other things that are free. But if they do, then you only have to maintain one list. And that's another thing that you want to do is just minimize the duplication of effort that you are trying to do when you have multiple things that you need to manage. If they have letter templates, that's great because then you can run your thank you letters off of it directly. There's any number of things that are nice to haves that, again, if you can eliminate the duplication of effort and eliminate the number of products that you need to have in order to get things done, that's even better. So those are the, some of the things that I'm looking for. All right, so we are rapidly running out of time. So I'm gonna talk about the things that aren't easy that you may want to deprioritize unless it's really worth the money. And one of them is grant proposals. So as much as foundation and corporate grant proposals can bring in some good money, sometimes it's not worth the effort. And so I really try hard to disqualify myself. It's the, how many different ways can I figure out that I'm not going to get this grant because I only want to think about the ones that I have a high likelihood of getting and give yourself twice as much time as you think you need to write this thing because it almost always takes more time. And with that in mind, calculate the cost of your time and the opportunity cost of your time when you're trying to figure out if this is a grant that's worth pursuing. For most organizations, I'm always surprised the number of hoops that they will go through for like a $500 grant. And it's just not worth it most of the time. So unless it is like a one page form that you can fill out in five minutes for something that is in the 500 to $1,000 range, I usually say skip it unless it's a slam dunk. Okay, so amongst all of these things, the main goals that I'm thinking about is as you look at everything you need to do, pick your big rocks first. And what I mean by that is back to a productivity analogy, which is that idea of the, if you have to put rocks, stones, pebbles, and sand into a jar, what do you put in first? You put the big rocks in first, because if you don't put the big rocks in first, the other stuff isn't going to fit. So what are your big rocks? What are the things that you definitely need to get done that are the not negotiable things that you need to do? And that'll give you an opportunity to prioritize those things that are more important and a more effective use of your time. So to sum up, tie your activities to the development cycle whenever possible. Create those kind of routine daily, weekly, monthly, and quarterly plans that you can just slot in the specific tasks into each one of those buckets to give a little bit of structure to your overall schedule. 
start with those inner circle donors and make sure that they're well taken care of so they will continue to be your inner circle donors and then just carefully consider all of the other tactics. And as you think about those fundraising events and those things that you might wanna take off of your list, use the matrix that Jim talked about and pick those big rocks and prioritize what you're gonna do. So those are all the tips that I have for you for today. And I apologize for going a little bit over, but uh, this is who we are. And one of the things that we do like to make available to everyone is that if you go to this website, which is our website, goldbusters.net slash free, we have a whole bunch of different resources available there. You can download them completely for free. We don't even ask for your contact information. And as Jim mentioned, if you wanna just copy and steal it, that is awesome. Hopefully it'll look good to your boss.